it really is a privilege to have you all here in, in, this, in this splendid environment for this discussion on a, on a rather sober topic. Um, and actually, to, to kick off our discussion today, and we have um, the, the, the theme of the conference is Islamism, the global solutions to a global threat, as you all know. Um, to kick off our discussion, we have our, the chairman of the Imam Foundation, Mr. Ribal al-Assad. My name is William Morris. I'll be chairing some of the proceedings here today. I'm from the Next Century Foundation. Um, many of you know each other, and we, we really look forward to a very interesting discussion. Uh, it's, it's an honor to have many of you here, all of you here, I beg your pardon. We're really, really very honored. But we're most honored to have the chairman of the Amman Foundation with us. Ribal is Syrian, as you all know. He's a deep thinker on, on the current crisis, both in Syria and the wider Middle East, and has, has worked actively to try and resolve the situ situation in Syria, the crisis in Syria, for many years. And his work with the Amman Foundation is key to that. Uh, so we turn to Ribal al-Assad, uh, the chairman of the Imam Foundation, and our host Thank today, Ribal. Thank you very much, William. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, William, for this uh, introduction. And uh, thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Good afternoon, distinguished colleagues, lords, ladies, and gentlemen, and welcome on behalf of the Iman Foundation. Today, we are gathered to discuss the problem of Islamism and global solution to what truly is a global threat, because sadly, the need for solution is more urgent than ever. The slaughter of 150 people of, at Kenya Garissa's University College last week is only the latest reminder that Islamism is a global phenomenon and the greatest threat to world peace and stability since the Nazis. Meanwhile, in Libya, Islamist affiliates to Islamist states have carried out several high-profile attacks in recent weeks, including the beheading of 21 Egyptian cops. Libya has been in a state approaching anarchy since Islamist militias hijacked that country's revolution during the Arab Spring, just as happened in my own homeland, Syria. Indeed, recent developments in Syria itself have borne out some of my worst fears, which have been warning about for several years now, not only the, sectarian, the sectarianism of, uh, of uh, civil war, but it has also been spiraling into a regional sectarian war. And before I go into dis discussing the, the geopolitical situation that is fueling the conflict in Syria and elsewhere, let me remind you of the human cost of Islamist violence there. Just last week, in an attack on the central Syrian village of Mabuja, Islamic State fighters killed over 40 people, mostly civilians, and these were just the latest victims. Thousands of civilians have been killed, not only with bombs and bullets, but often in the most brutal ways imaginable. Two weeks ago, the Islamic State released a video showing the beheading of eight men said to be Shiite Muslims from the central province of Hama. And last month, Kurdish authorities announced they had evidence that the Islamic State in Iraq has used chemical weapons. But while the world now knows all about the barbarism of that particular organization, the Islamic State is far from being the only problem. Less than two weeks ago, the northern western city of Idlib fell, not to the Islamic State, but to the Nusra Front. The Syrian affiliate of Al-Qaeda, who also kidnapped 300 Kurds in the same part of Syria on Sunday. As I have long argued, while there are dozens of Islamist groups with different names, in reality, they are little more than brand names describing the same product, a product whose key features are religious extremism and murderous violence. In fact, experts like Fawaz Gerges of the London School of Economics argue that the focus on Islamic State has distracted us from the fact that other groups are just as bad. He says, and I quote, the international community really has lost sight of the fact that the Al-Nusra Front is as dangerous, is as extremist. And by focusing solely on the Islamic State, we are actually helping other extremists. That's why the Canadian Defense Minister, Jason Kenney's recent insistence that Canada will only target Islamic State and will leave the Nusra Front alone makes no sense. If it's left alone, in a few years, the Nusra Front will be the big, frightening group like the Islamic State now. Now, it's, ba it's bad enough that we are unwittingly aiding the Nusra Front by targeting the Islamic State only and forgetting about others who share the exact same perverted ideology. 
But I'm afraid there are some commentators who want us to bag the group deliberately. The Nusra Front's friends in Qatar and Turkey want them to dissociate themselves from Al-Qaeda, not to abandon violence of, or Islamist ideology, as you understand, but merely to undergo a rebrand. And some in the West seem to think that if they do this, the sudden, then suddenly there will be suitable allies for the democratic world. For example, both Lina Khatib of the Carnegie Middle East Center and Charles Lister from Brookings Doha Center in Qatar have suggested we should support Al-Qaeda's Nusra Front and other Islamist groups in their struggle against the Syrian regime and the Islamic State as if they are so somehow good Islamists and bad Islamists, good terrorists and bad terrorists. Ladies and gentlemen, let us not forget that it was not the Islamic State but Al-Qaeda that carried out the 9-11 attacks in 2001. If only Osama bin Laden had thought of rebranding himself as a moderate, perhaps he would be alive today as a Western ally. To seek alliances with self-styled moderates is to repeat exactly the same mistake the, way the West made at the very beginning of the conflict in Syria. And you don't have to make my word for that. One of the foremost advocates of providing the Syrian rebels with military support was Robert Ford, the former US ambassador to Syria. And he has now admitted that the results have been disastrous. Ford said in February this year that for too long the US has looked the other way while the groups they were backing in Syria worked alongside the Nusra Front. As he now admits, the Nusra Front is just as dangerous and yet they keep pretending they're nice guys, they're Syrian guys. He also admits significant amounts of US military aid were leaked to the Nusra Front, so we've already done more than enough to support those particular extremists. In this context, victory for the so-called rebels would lead not to the liberation of Syria, but to disaster. Former French Defense Minister Paul Quiles recently argued that the fall of the regime without an organized transition would lead to a Libya-type situation, the collapse of the state, chaos, then the destabilization of Lebanon and doubtless Jordan too. As he also condemned nominal Western allies like Saudi, Qatar and Turkey for seemingly working towards that very outcome. That brings me to another major mistake made by the West in Syria, our poor choice of allies and failure to understand their role in the conflict. Last October, looking back at the conflict so far, US Vice President Joe Biden told students at Harvard University our allies in the region were our largest problem in Syria and explained that they had effectively started a proxy Sunni Shia war in their determination to bring down the Syrian regime, deliberately cultivating groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Nusra, ISIS, and later the Islamic State. It was later reported that the Vice President subsequently apologized even for raising the issue of our allies complicitly with such groups. But is, it is ridiculous that the most powerful country in the world should be apologizing for telling the truth. The same red lines must apply to all, with no special treatments for so-called allies who sponsor terror, because again, there is no distinction to be made between bad terrorism sponsored by non-allies and good terrorism sponsored by allies. And we cannot advocate democracy and freedom in some regions while accepting the opposite in others. Because as we have seen, the result is too often terror on our own doorsteps. Take the massacre of the Charlie Hebdo cartoonist in Paris. It has been reported that two of the terrorists, the Kouachi brother received weapons training in Yemen in 2011, and the Yemen-based Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula claimed responsibility for the attack. But to understand why these men did what they did, it is not enough to trace their connection to particular terror groups. We must also understand who is really behind the rise of such groups and sustaining them with money and TV stations broadcasting jihadist propaganda to recruit new members. Now, the recent death of King Abdullah focused the world's attention on Saudi Arabia which had itself been the target of a terrorist attack early in January. This raised fear of further attacks from both Iraq and Yemen, but the threat to Saudi Arabia stems just from its geographical, stems not just from its geographical location. More important is the fact that the legitimacy of the regime is based on its adherence to Salafi Wahhabism, an ideology in many ways indistinguishable from that of the terrorists. Of course, King Abdullah condemned terrorism and explicitly denounced this Islamic State and his successor King Salman is expected to do the same. But the religious ideology of Saudi Arabia openly endorses the oppression of women 
and hatred of, of, of other Muslim sects, Christians and Jews, as well as strict punishment like limb imputations. In recent months, a Saudi blogger that has been sentenced to a thousand lashes and a woman publicly beheaded in the holy city of Mecca. The Saudi government has recently passed a law imposing the death penalty on anyone caught smuggling Christian Bibles into the country. And in 2012, the Grand Mufti notoriously called on Muslims to burn down churches throughout the Middle East. Again, we must ask, how is this any different from the ideology of the Islamic State, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban? And why do our government not speak out against it? In fact, the Swedish ambassador to Saudi Arabia has been withdrawn after criticizing the regime's treatment of women and minorities, and she is to be com commended. But we must understand that it's not a case of balancing ethics with realpolitik, as many observers believe, because realpolitik demands that we recognize a threat to our own national security and act accordingly. Prince Charles recently spoke of his alarm at the radicalization of British Muslims, as well as his deep concern for the suffering of Christian churches in the Middle East. And I sincerely hope that he raised these issues when he met King Salman in February, because it is incredibly naive to imagine that the persecutions of Christians in Saudi Arabia is not taken by Islamists here in the West as a green light to kill non-Muslims. The extent of the political influence of Islamic extremism in Saudi was revealed last November when the information minister Abdelaziz Khoja closed down a satellite TV station that was inciting sectarian hatred and violence. But instead of being commended, he was promptly sacked and the extremist TV station was reopened. In fact, when I asked a more senior Saudi and Western educated official to take a tougher line on these TV stations, he feigned surprised and said he thought I was in favor of democracy and free speech, as if promoting hatred and violence has anything to do with democracy. Of course, it is not just Saudi Arabia we should be concerned with, but Kuwait is another dubious ally. Last year, the Justice and Islamic Affairs Minister Nayef al-Ajmi was exposed by U.S. Treasury Under Secretary David Cohen as a prominent fundraiser for terrorist groups in Syria. But rather than being prosecuted, he was allowed to quietly resign, citing health reasons, so we must take a harder lines with these countries. Qatar is another. Sir Mar Markham Rifkin, the chair of the UK Parliament's Intelligence and Security Committee, has rightly pointed to Qatar's role in promoting terrorism and said they must choose their friend or live with the consequences. Unfortunately, when US Defense Secretary Ashton Carter was asked about Qatari funding for extremists by the, by the House Armed Services Committee just three weeks ago, he acknowledged the problem, but then said we can continue to work with them on areas we disagree which suggests that he's unwilling to take a sufficiently hard line in his own country's interests. And the problem with this Gulf state is not just their ideological support for Islamism. Bernard Squarcini, a previous head of, previous head of France's counter-espionage and counter-terrorism intelligence agency, has pointed to Saudi intelligence actively supporting extremist groups from Afghanistan to Lebanon and Syria to Egypt to Mali and the former head of French interior intelligence, Yves Monet, one of also our board members, has accused both Qatar and Saudi of funding extremist Islamist networks in France. It is clear that the vast amount of money and arms make their way from a variety of Saudi and other sources to Islamist terrorists, especially in Syria and Iraq. But it is not just covert support for extremist groups that we should be aware of. Saudi is openly strengthening ties with Hamas, and with the Muslim Brotherhood throughout the Middle East in a bid to build what it calls today an Arab alliance, effectively in opposition to Iran. There are two key reasons for this. First, Iran will be in a much stronger position internationally that now that it has reached a nuclear deal with the US. Maybe Potkin would disagree with that. He's still waiting for the agreement to be reached. <laughs> Which is precisely because the US sees Iran as a lesser evil compared to the Islamist groups in Syria. And secondly, that very same rise of Islamic extremism means minorities throughout the region now look to Iran as their savior, including Shia Muslims in Eastern Saudi Arabia itself. So the Saudis see Iran as even more of a threat. In response, their Arab alliance involves strengthening the Gulf Cooperation Council, as well as cultivating wider regional allies. For example, Egypt, is a part of the Saudi-led coalition fighting the Houthis in Yemen, largely because the Egyptian regime is worried about losing economic support from Saudi. And for the same reason, it is even under pressure to, to, under pressure to reconcile with the Muslim Brotherhood.
Even more ominously, according to the liberal Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi, it was Saudi and Turkish sponsors who backed the Nusra Front's capture of the Syrian city of Idlib, and he suggests that coordination between Turkish and Saudi intelligence has never been as good as now, despite the fact that they were previously seen as rivals. On that note, however, it is clear that the so-called Arab alliance has little to do with genuine Arabic unity. For example, the Houthis are Arabs too, not Iranians, and if they were not being marginalized, they would not even think of looking for, uh, to Iran for help. The same goes for Arab Shias, Arab Alawites, and Arab Christians throughout the region. And on the other hand, what is so Arabic about an alliance that now includes Turkey and Pakistan? In reality, the Saudi-led alliance is not Arabic, but merely sectarian, so it should be cause for great concern that another of its allies in, that's another of its allies in regards to this conflict in Yemen is the U.S., which is providing logistical and intelligence support to Gulf Cooperation Council-led military operations and unwittingly participating in precisely the kind of sectarian conflict that is tearing the region apart. So the conflicts in Syria and Iraq are already sectarian proxy wars, with Iran backing both regimes and the Houthis rebels, while Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Turkey support the Islamist insurgents in Syria and Iraq and the regime in Yemen. I will return to Turkey a little later, but first I want to explain that the conflict is not just regional, but global with both Russia and China joining Iran in siding with the Syrian and Iraqi regime. And it is reported that Russia is about to supply Iran as well as Syria with its long-promised S-300 air defense system. In fact, Russia and China themselves have increasingly closed bilateral ties. China is directly challenging the NATO power's policy of cutting off credit to Russia by pledging to extend financial aid to Moscow. The two countries have also been boosting cooperation in the military, financial, and energy sectors, increasingly switching to settlement in Yuan, which will reduce the influence of the dollars on the world financial and energy markets, and the Chinese recently announced a Silk Road-style economic corridor linking China to Russia and Mongolia. Moreover, Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu has announced in November that the two countries are intent on forming a collective regional security system and planning joint naval drills not only in the Pacific, but even in the Mediterranean. And Chinese Defense Minister Chang Wanchuan has spoken of the ever closer military-to-military -military relation between the two countries, including high-level visits, joint exercises, and professional communications. Recent Russian military exercises seems to have been deliberately chosen to send a warning to NATO. And Russia's ambassador to Denmark recently warned that if the Danes signed up to the NATO missile defense program, Danish warships will be targeted for Russia's, by Russia's nuclear weapons. On the diplomatic front, China has backed Russia with the Chinese ambassador to Belgium, Chu Qing, blaming the Ukraine crisis on a game being played by the Western powers and calling on them to take Russia's security concerns more seriously. China and Russia have been pushed together because they both feel threatened by what they perceive as a US policy of encirclement, closing in, on their borders. And these concerns inform their entire foreign policy including relations with the Middle East. Inevitably, many Western observers will see Russian-Chinese military ties as a threat, but it is imperative that we are not drawn further into a proxy war in the Middle East. Islamic extremism is the greatest threat to the world that has faced since the Nazis, but the enemy is active not only in the Middle East, but within the borders of every country I have mentioned. We have a clear common interest in uniting to defeat it. And unfortunately, our interventions have sometimes been counterproductive. Certainly, the Western powers badly mishandled the so-called Arab Spring. Last December, Russia's chief of general staff, Valery Gerasimov, told a meeting of foreign military attaches in Moscow that without the financial and technical assistance provided by the US and its allies to rebels fighting the Syrian government, the rapid growth of Islamic State would not have been possible. Sadly, this is true. And it's not Russian observers who understand the risk of well-intended intervention fanning the flames. As G U.S. General Lloyd Austin III said in 2013, that the conflict in Syria cannot and will not be resolved militarily, and warned that, if left unchecked, the spread of violence and terrorist activity emanating from Syria could result in a long, drawn-out conflict that extends from Beirut to Damascus to Baghdad to Yemen. Indeed, as Robert Ford admitted,
many of the arms now in the hands of Islamic extremism, like the Islamic State, al-Nusra, were supplied by the West to supposedly moderate rebels in Syria, like the Hazm Brigade, who simply surrendered their weapon while many even joined the extremists because they actually share the same ideology. I warned at the time that arming any of the groups fighting in Syria would be a grave mistake. Of course, we all know that the regime is tyrannical and does not represent the Syrian people, but that never meant that every rebel group stood for democracy, and very soon it was the most extreme groups that dominated the opposition to the regime. The fundamental problem was that the West did not intervene politically early on, before the conflict became militarized, which left other countries to take the lead. And mostly certain Gulf states that were worried about the domino effect of the Arab Spring and who wanted to counter the influence of Syria's allies, Iran, made sure that those extremist elements dominated the opposition and used jihadist TV stations to foment sectarian war. Saudi and Qatar channeled billions of dollars and later arms to competing Islamist groups, while the democratic world stood by. With help from Qatar, as well as Turkey, the Muslim Brotherhood effectively hijacked the, the revolution from outside Syria itself, again, as the West stood by. As a result, Michael Morell, the outgoing director of the CIA, has described the situation in Syria, which is attracting fighters from all over the world, is the single biggest threat to US national security. And as Europe is much closer, we know the threat must be even higher. So why did it take nine months for the UK and other European government to respond to this warning? So former US Attorney General Eric Holder is right to stress the importance of a broad counterterrorism strategy to earlier identify radicalized individuals who are traveling to the region and returning home as trained terrorists. China's special envoy to the Middle East, Wu Siqi, speaks of the same danger, arguing and I quote, after being immersed in extremist ideas, when they return home, they will pose a severe challenge and security risks. He suggests that all the countries threatened by such terrorism should form a closely knit community of shared interests. We have seen how real is, is the danger is, not only from extremists returning from the Middle East, but from lone wolf's attacks all over the world. And more recently in Paris and Copenhagen, but before that in Ottawa, in Boston, in Belgium, Russia, Western China, and of course here in London. The Home Secretary Theresa May announced in November that no fewer than 40 terror plots have been foiled in the UK since the 7-7 attacks, but it only takes one terror plot to slip through the net for innocent lives to be lost. The terrorist threat is global, and this fact is reflected on the ground throughout the Middle East and North Africa. British MP Khaled Mahmoud said last year there are 2,000 British fighters while the German security official estimates there, there are 1,800 Germans, far more than previous estimate of a few hundred which Western governments have preferred to stick to in order to prevent panic. The CIA and UN estimate is that there are a total of 15,000 foreign fighters in Syria and Iraq, but US Attorney General, General, uh, General Eric Holder has said there are around 7,000 fighters from the West alone, which would leave only 8,000 from the Arab from other Arab and Muslim countries. Logically though, there must be far more, than, far more fighters from the Arab and Muslim countries than Western ones. The population is poorer, the government have less sophisticated surveillance technology and infrastructure, and there are a lot more mosques and clerics who are funded by some of our allies in the Gulf countries to recruit people. So the number of fighters from the Middle East must be at least 10 times higher than the number from Europe. Most of these foreign fighters enter Syria from Turkey, which remains an important player. Turkey has also trained and armed al-Nusra, so it's little wonder that despite being a NATO member, it refused to sign up to the coalition against the Islamic State. In fact, one of last year's ISIS attack on the Syrian Kurdish town of Kobani was launched from Turkey, and it was reported that senior Turkish intelligence officials even had talks with the ISIS leaders because they see the Kurds as a threat to Turkey and want to see them weakened. Nevertheless, it seems that Turkey has now resolved to drop support for the Islamic State in favor of al-Nusra only. You see, the Islamic State have destroyed many churches and other religious sites in Syria, even Muslim tombs with their, which they regard as blasphemous. So the fact that they left alone the tomb of the Ottoman uh, forefather, Suleiman Shah, suggests that they had a deal with Turkey. And the fact that the Turks recently entered Syria to remove it suggests that the deal is over. They have now secured it in a Kurdish village on the Syrian side of the border, giving them a pretext to retain a presence of their own there, acting as an ongoing threat against the Kurds. Anyway, 
Turkey's motive for supporting Islamist is the first is, is the first place are different from those of the, the Gulf states. It sees Syria as a natural place to extend its influence south to the Arab world, cutting off Iran and sealing Turkey's own role as the champion of the Sunnis throughout the Middle East, effectively rebuilding the Ottoman Empire. When the Muslim Brotherhood Yusuf al qaradawi talked a few years ago of Islam's peaceful conquest of the West, the vehicle he had in mind was Turkey's prospective EU membership. But with that rejected, Turkey now has a new focus and that is why it now has no interest in the EU. And in December, President Erdogan responded to EU criticism, EU criticism of its crackdown on opposition media by declaring, when taking such a step, we don't care what the EU might say or if the EU is going to accept us. Instead, it is happy to let Islamist forces gain as much territory as possible in Syria and Iraq until the international community is forced to allow the Turkish army to move in and impose order checking the influence of Iran in the process. The West let Turkey set the agenda in Syria once before, and we have seen the consequences. So it is vital that we do not make the same mistake twice. The international community must form a united front against Islamic terrorism and its various sponsors. Countries like China and Russia may not be our natural allies for the democracies of the West, but they are at least rational actors in international relations who understand their own interest and most importantly understand the threat of Islamic terrorism, one they face in common with the West. The end of the Cold War means there is no need to sustain hostilities and alliances formed in the shadow of war with the Soviet Union, when those very alliances threaten global stability more than the East-West tensions, they are unnecessarily feuding. We must rethink such alliances and be more sophisticated in our approach to the politics of the Middle East. We must not allow ourselves to be manipulated by those who seek, in the words of President Putin again, to use extremism as a geopolitical instrument, playing one power off against another for their own ends while the terrorists they sponsor run riot. Instead, we must merge the new sophistication of terrorism with the new sophistication of our own. Of course, we must take on terrorism militarily, as President Obama has promised to, but we must also make the effort to trace the financial and political lifelines that sustain the terrorists and to cut them off at source. For example, President Putin again is right to note that extremist ideology is gaining momentum in the virtual sphere through which extremist organizations are trying to recruit followers. So we must shut down jihadist website, along with any other media that promotes religious hatred and include murderous violence. We must stop pretending that the countries that tolerate and even encourage Islamic extremism are our allies. And we must ensure instead that they face the consequences of their actions. And of course, we must do as much as we can to promote economic development and political freedom throughout the Islamic world and beyond so that young people there can face the future with hope instead of despair in which extremism thrives. This will not happen overnight. It took Europe hundreds of years to put sectarian and religious wars behind it and to develop stable and secure democratic societies. But we can help the rest of the world learn from that experience, even if it takes many years of careful cultural diplomacy and investment in education, development and promoting civil society. This is because it's not enough simply to defeat groups like the Islamic State militarily, nor even to cut off the sources of funding to particular groups, because as I said, Islamic State, Al-Nusra, Al-Qaeda and the Muslim Brotherhood are no more than brand names. As long as the ideology of Islamism is allowed to flourish and encouraged by wealthy states, new sources of funding will spring up and new terror groups will emerge with new brand names and that same perverted ideology. I believe that the Iman Foundation has a vital role to play in putting an end to this vicious cycle. The first step is to recognize the extent and severity of the problem and to resolve to tackle it with renewed vigor while holding to liberal and democratic values because only they will ultimately ensure the defeat of Islamism. Thank you very much. Thank you.